I'm, I'm Fiona Anthony. I'm a solicitor at NP Law, uh, which is the legal department at Norfolk County Council. Um, I have been a solicitor for a very long time and um, I used to be an independent person at a district council uh, for about five years where I dealt with um, code of conduct complaints um, about district and parish councillors. So I've maintained a, a special interest in standards and it's still quite an interesting um, dynamic area. So I'm going to start today talking we got to where we are today um, and where we think we might be going. So um, our current standards regime um, was last overhauled with the coalition government in 2010. Gosh, that seems an awfully long time ago, doesn't it? And they were very keen on getting rid of, of red tape. And at the time, it was felt that the standard system had become much too centralised and too bureaucratic. So the intention was to simplify it. So we moved to the Localism Act 2011, which is the current regime um, for our standards. And so it's been around for about nine, uh, eight, nine years. Um, and it, I think, is probably at the point where we've all tested it, realised what the issues are. Um, and now we're thinking, actually, is it still fit for purpose? And I'll explore some of the issues as we go along. So um, the intention behind the Localism Act um, was for local authorities to promote and maintain high standards of contact, conduct. So, again, moving towards that idea of, of localism um, and away from centralisation. And... The Act introduced local codes of conduct based on the Nolan principles, which we will talk about um, in a little while. So it gave responsibility to um, local government for investigating alleged breaches of codes. It um, made it the responsibility of the monitoring officer of the principal authority to establish and then maintain a register of members' interests. And the Act also introduced a new criminal offence, which was failing to comply with statutory requirements for the disclosure of pecuniary interests, so DPIAs. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail um, towards the end of the talk when we see where we've we've got to. So um, in about 2018, there was a review of standards by the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Um, and I refer to that throughout these as the CSPL. Um, and it looked at basically local government ethical standards. So that's from, you know, it could be a county council, district council, but also included town and parish councils. And their report uh, was issued on the 30th of January 2019. Um, it's incredibly thorough, comprehensive. Um, it includes a lot of detail about what the problems actually were. Um, and it's a really interesting read. I would recommend it, although it's um, probably around 150 pages. Um, really quite good if you find trouble sleeping or um, good for killing spiders. So the review of standards um, quite rightly pointed out that actually what, what we do in parish councils is actually impacting the lives of, of everyday citizens. Um, and obviously we need high standards of conduct um, to protect the integrity of decision making, to maintain public confidence and then with all that to safeguard local democracy. So for some fairly high level um, ideas there, but we do go into an awful lot of detail uh, a little bit further down. So what the review found was that the majority of councillors do maintain high standards of conduct. Um, and I think we all felt very heartened by that. Uh, and we can see that, you know, councillors work very hard most of the time, but there was some evidence of misconduct relating in particular to certain things, so bullying and harassment, disruptive behaviour, and then persistent and repeated misconduct. So those were only in a small number of cases, but it felt like that in, in those small number of cases, they were obviously very distressing to the people who 
um, were on the receiving end of the misconduct. So the Committee on Standards um, in Public Life um, published a huge raft of, of recommendations. So there were 26 recommendations for change. Um, these were mainly for the government to implement. So that's because they needed primary or secondary legislation. So either an act So we always acknowledged that it was going to take a bit of time for those changes to be made, given how, how long it takes for something to go through Parliament, um, and also accepting that, that the government at the time in 2019 um, was and now still is dealing with Brexit. Um, and of course, we've just added in a pandemic as well. So um, it, interestingly, lawmaking at the moment is happening at a ridiculously rapid pace um, because of the coronavirus legislation and the emergency powers. Um, but it means that other things have been put to one side. Um, so it's unlikely that any changes that need legislation are going to happen anytime soon. But the committee actually took quite an interesting approach and said, OK, well, these are our 26 big recommendations for change. But there are also some things that um, local authorities can do and should do um, that are just a matter of best practice and they don't need um, they don't need any legislation. And the other thing that they they said and that, that we're going to talk about in much more depth today is that there's a need for a single national model code of conduct. Um, that should be developed by the local government association in consultation with others. Um, so the onus was then on the local government association to do something about that. And there would be a new requirement to either adopt the um, local authority code or a new national model um, with perhaps some local amendments or adjustments. They also recommended, and again, we'll come on to this in a little while, um, that there should be a new presumption that councillors are acting in their official capacity, um, particularly when they're on social media, because that has caused some problems. Um, they also recommended that there should be prohibitions on bullying and harassment with definitions and examples, that councillors should be required to comply with any formal standards investigation, um, because there had been some problems with um, councillors just not engaging uh, in the investigation process. And they also suggested that trivial or malicious allegations by councillors should be prohibited. Um, I think that's quite problematic because it's difficult to tell sometimes what's trivial or malicious. One person's trivial is actually some person's really important. So the um, local government did as, uh, association did as they were asked, although it took them quite a long time. Um, there was silence between the committee report um, in January 2019 um, and then um, the LGA produced its draft model code of conduct um, in early summer 2020 and they consulted on it. The consultation has now closed um, and so if you have any comments. Um, it's difficult to feed those in formally um, at the moment. But um, I'm sure there will be another opportunity to comment on the very final draft. So um, the code contains uh, some, some various things at the beginning, the purpose, the application, the principles of public life, some general principles and some specific obligations. I'm going to go through all those now if we can move on to um, onto the next slide. So the purpose um, of the draft model code is to, as it says there, create and maintain public confidence in the role of um, member and local government. So this is on page three of the draft. Um, and basically it's saying that um, it, it helps councillors to understand the behaviour expected of them. It should provide a personal check and balance for them. It uh, demonstrates the um, type of conduct against which action may be taken. Um, it protects the reputation of local government and also sets out any conduct expected um, together with a, a minimum set of obligations. 
So that's all fairly straightforward. On to the, um, thank you. So um, there is a question about when the, the draft code should apply. Um, it's always been very clear that it should apply when someone's acting in their capacity as a member of the council. But it's also it's been less clear um, about when they they might be or they're giving the impression that they're acting in that capacity. So the Committee on Standards in Public Life thought that it should always apply um, in those circumstances. Um, but um, in the code, so they put in the code in square brackets when they think um, those circumstances should apply. So, for example, if you have a councillor who's um, on social media, if they are um, describing themselves on Twitter as Councillor Joe Bloggs, then they're very obviously um, acting in their capacity as a councillor. Very clear. Whatever they're saying, I think that's very clear. Um, if they call themselves Daddy Joe B and they're doing their, their tweeting or their blogging, um, should they be held accountable in, in the same way? Um, and that's always been an area of ambiguity and I'm not sure that that's really been cleared up here. So um, the code mentions the seven principles of public life and here we have a picture of, of uh, Lord Nolan um, who whose name is interchangeable so sometimes it's the Nolan principles and he was the first chair um, of the committee in uh, uh, on standards in public life and so that's why we refer to these as the as the Nolan principles and I guess um, you know the, these are the seven principles which are always held up um, if we were to put you all in a, a little breakout room and say what do you expect from councillors. These are probably the sorts of things that you would come up with. They're not really very objectionable um, and they're really, you know, good practice, I guess. So moving on to the next, um, the next slide, uh, the draft code talks about general principles um, and it talks about, um, well, it says, I will on all occasions do these certain things. So it's written in the first person throughout. Some people have taken issue with that and think that it should be um, less personal. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it. In a way, it's making it very clear to the councillor that that's actually what they're signing up to um, and that's what they're going to be doing. Um, on to the next slide, there are some more general principles. Um, and again, um, these aren't really very uh, contentious um, and I'll cover them because they're all covered in the specific obligations. So the specific obligations start on the next slide um, and under the heading of um, civility. So if Hannah we could go on to the next slide. So the, the first point is that we should treat other councillors and members of the public with civility. Now, this is a bit of an issue. Um, people have suggested that civility is very different from respect. Um, I think we would probably always want people to treat us with respect. And sometimes people can be civil, but not respectful. The, um, the, the draft code, the little guidance bit in the draft code says civility means politeness and courtesy in behaviour, speech and in the written word. And it goes on to say, you should not subject individuals, groups of people or organisations to unreasonable or excessive personal attack. Well, my personal view here is that we shouldn't be actually... Um, uh, subjecting anybody to any personal attack, let alone whether it's unreasonable or excessive. Um, it goes on to say in your contact with the public, you should treat them courteously. Rude and offensive behaviour lowers the public expectations and confidence in its elected representatives. Um, so those are, that's, that's one of the, mo the more controversial points of this draft code, uh, the use of the word civility rather than respect. I mean, I do get to the point sometimes when we're looking at having definitions of all this and thinking about the wording you know do, do we have to tell these people this um, but you know ob obviously we do so um, 
moving on to the next slide, um, obviously, again, um, it should be fairly clear that people shouldn't be bullying or harassing anybody. Um, there is an explanation in the code. Um, and again, bullying and harassment, bullying may be characterized as offensive, intimidating, malicious or insulting behavior and abuse or misuse of power through means that undermine, humiliate, denigrate or injure the recipient. And it goes on to say that it can be done um, as a one off or on a regular basis. And it can be done by by all sorts of different means, whether it's social media or in person. Um, what the Committee on Standards in Public Life suggested was that there should be some specific examples that, that might be helpful. Um, and I think that's probably probably is true. But but sometimes the issue is that people who are bullying or intimidating um, actually don't have that self-awareness um, and probably if they're challenged on it, wouldn't necessarily think that, that that's what they're doing. So that's where I think maybe some examples could be helpful. But then there's always the question, when you give some examples, people take them as being exhaustive rather than actual examples. So um, moving on to the next slide, um, officers of the council should be impartial. Well, I think that's that's pretty un un uncontroversial. That should be the case. And the same with um, what's on the next slide, the confidentiality and access to information um, is also something that's that's non-controversial. Obviously, everyone who has receives um information that's sensitive shouldn't be um, shouldn't be disclosed um, unless it's necessary to do so and, it, and, and they're authorised to do so. Um, number seven on the next slide is under the title of disrepute and obviously again um, councillors shouldn't be bringing their role or their council into disrepute. Um, there's a note in the guidance to the, the draft model code which says be us to scrutiny than that of other members of the public. Um, so maybe that feels a little bit unfair, but equally, if, um, if these are decision makers, then um, I think that makes quite a lot of sense. Um, and just an example, I used to be an independent member of Norfolk's police authority. And when I first joined, um, I was put in a room and told that, you know, whatever I did, I must not speed uh, on any of the roads in Norfolk. And I never have. Um, but but it was one of those things that, you know, um, it was made very clear that if anyone was caught speeding or breaking the law in any way, um, they would be removed um, from that particular position because it would bring the police authority into, into disrepute. You can't have people policing the police um, and then breaking the law. So moving on to um, number eight in the code, you'll be pleased to hear that there's not, <laughs> there, are, there are only 12 parts and most of it is, um, isn't, uh, isn't controversial. Um, you, councillors shouldn't use their position um, to improperly advantage themselves or disadvantage um, anybody else. Um, and similarly, fairly uncontroversial is number nine, not misusing um, council resources. More controversial um, is on the next slide at number 10, and that's about interests. So um, in the draft code, the draft code is given over to quite a lot uh, in Appendix B of how interest should be registered and declared. And I think this is really important in terms of transparency, but also protection for councillors. Um, it's just really important that, that members of the public are aware that those who are making decisions on their behalf and about their local community um, aren't breaching the code in any way and are not seeking to advantage themselves um, in any way. It's still up to councillors to declare, to, to decide whether to declare an interest. But again, Appendix B quite helpfully sets out um, some of the some of the issues and a little bit of guidance around it. And this is an area which I think um, 
there should be much more mandatory training about for for counsellors. I think it's a bit of a minefield at the moment. Um, and I think people just need to be careful and transparent. I understand that they don't necessarily want everybody to know their business, but equally, if they're standing for public office, sometimes it's really important that people do know their business um, and understand what's there. Um, as an example, again, when I was on the police authority, we were told to declare absolutely everything. Um, and at the time, I think it was the um, was it the RSPCA or the National Trust was doing something that was um, fairly, it, it was lobbying and it was becoming slightly political. Um, and so we had to declare those interests and we were told that if we were friends of anything, um, we also had to declare those interests. So I had to um, note down that uh, because my children were little at the time, I was a friend of Norwich Puppet Theatre. So um, probably the only time it's appeared on a register of interests. But again, for me, it felt more comfortable that I was being transparent. Um, I also had to say that I was a, a Norwich City season ticket holder um, because we sometimes had to make issues about charging for policing um, for the Norwich City games. And if, for, for example, you know, that was to go wrong somewhere, um, I had an interest as, a, as someone who had paid money to go and see those games. Um, so interest really, really important. And I think it's a, an area that, that all of us need to focus on um, and to make sure that our councillors understand their responsibilities. Moving on to the next slide, um, again, more about transparency. So gifts and hospitality, making sure that people don't, um, uh, don't gain any advantage and aren't kind of pushed into making decisions or bribed into it. Um, Number 12 says that um, councillors should register with the monitoring officer. I'm sorry, that's back on the last slide, Hannah. Um, thank you. Any gift um, with an estimated value of at least £25. Um, what the Committee on Standards in Public Life suggested was actually £50. Um, but, you know, that's that's I think 25 is quite reasonable in terms of, again, transparency. The guidance in the draft code also suggests that councillors might want to notify the monitoring officer of any significant. Again, my own view is that maybe that should be more, um, more prominent. I think it's important that the monitoring officer knows um, about any activity uh, and any possibility that people are seeking to influence councillors. So moving on to the, um, the next slide, um, the code talks about breaches of the code, again sort of quite obviously but doesn't spend as much time as I would have expected on this. Um, most of the time is concentrated on the code itself. So it repeats what's set out in the 2011 Act that local authorities should have mechanisms to investigate allegations of the breach of the code, but also have proper arrangements for making decisions about those allegations and about any sanctions. Um, failure to comply with the requirements to register or declare um, disclosable pecuniary interests is still a criminal offence. Now, the Committee on Standards in Public Life recommended that it shouldn't be a public of a, a criminal offence, but because that would need legislation to change it, um, that is still in there and has to remain there until we get that legislation. The idea, I mean, I think I think everyone has has thought that it is a bit of a, um, an approach of a, a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It's disproportionate um, and it should be sufficient just to be able to um, declare a DPI um, rather than it then having to go off to the police, for example, to investigate. Um, and on the very few occasions that I came across where the police were asked to investigate, they didn't actually know what to do with it and felt that it should have been um, bounced back to, to the district council to investigate. Um, so on to the, um, onto the, the fine, oh, not quite the final slide, but um, one of the, um, the last bits, sorry, that's it. Um, 
the code talks about in, in the guidance talks about the internal resolution procedure um, on page seven um, and looks at an approach which again is more sort of proportionate when looking at investigating issues with potential breaches. So it starts um, looking at informal discussions with either the monitoring officer or an appropriate person and then moving up, escalating all the way along to possibly barring um, councillors for attending committees for up to two months. Now, the Committee on Standards in Public Life lamented the lack of sanctions with teeth. Um, and certainly as an independent person, I felt exactly the same way. It felt as though there should be some more sanctions for demonstrating the importance really of um, breaching a code of conduct. Um, the committee had suggested that there should be a suspension of a councillor for up to six months, but um, that that hasn't been included here. Um, and I think that's probably unlikely um, at the moment. So on to the next slide, looking at investigations. Um, principal authorities remain the ones who are um, who are responsible for undertaking formal investigations if there are any code breaches. The committee suggested that this should remain the case. Um, and again, it's up to principal authorities to have a look at, um, at what the sanctions should be. Looking at other recommendations, which I haven't spotted in the code um, because they're not there um, on, the on the next slide, um, the committee recommended that there should be qualified clerks, um, again, partly as a kind of safeguard so that um, everybody you know, knows what their position is. Um, the, there was also a recommendation for mandatory training for all parish councillors. Again, I think this is a really important thing um, and that actually if, if councillors aren't prepared to undergo training, then do we really want them representing us? And also really a need for transparency. So making sure that if there are any investigations um, and any sanctions applied, then it would be helpful to have those published in some way, probably just on the on the website of the parish council. So my final slide is where are we now? Uh, coming back to the initial question. Um, so the the consultation period has ended. The local government association is reviewing feedback from that consultation and is going to develop a final draft, taking into account all the comments. That will go to the LGA General Assembly in autumn 2020. I keep seeing that things are going to happen in the autumn um, and it feels to me like we're here. Um, so I don't know when that is. Um, possibly um, the code will be adopted. Um, it would certainly, from my point of view, be very helpful, I think, to have one code um, which applies across across different sorry, across different councils, whether that's district councils and parish councils, and particularly where sometimes we have twin or even triple hatters with people who sit on a parish council, maybe sit on a district council and possibly also sit on a, a county council. So um, that's a quick whiz through of my views um, on the, the draft model code of conduct. Um, I'm so sorry for the technology problems. Um, I hope that it hasn't um, interfered with your um, understanding of the code. If you have any questions, um, I am i don't know whether I can hear any um, or whether we could put those in the chat. Okay, would contributions in kind be considered a gift? My view is that they would be. Um, so. Again, this is this is my view in that I think that we should be all as transparent as possible. I guess it kind of depends what the kind is, but absolutely. So it can be things like hospitality. Um, again, kind of difficult to quantify how much that would that would account for. Um, so, for example, um, more recently in my in my job um, so I sometimes do business development and I was um, I have to go and look at venues and I was 
given the most amazing, lovely day out at centre parks. Um, difficult to quantify actually how much that should cost, but absolutely I declared it um, because I think that's really important in terms of, of transparency. So I do think that contributions in kind could be considered a gift. Again, doing my lawyer slightly sit on the fence thing, I would say that that might be, it, it might depend on exactly what it is. Um, but um, yeah, just be careful. And if in doubt, I would say declare it. So my next question that I've seen is what action or sanctions are available to deal with breaches? And is the process described in the code? Well, the process is described um, in terms of what the actions and sanctions are very briefly in the code, not as much as I would have liked. Um, and not as many sanctions um, as I would like. I know that when I talk to councillors, councillors are sometimes a bit, um, uh, maybe a little bit offended um, that I think there should be more sanctions. Um, but no, uh, there are no sanctions with teeth still. So what the um, what the guidance recommends, which is at the back of the um, draft code of conduct, is that um, we can move, as I said, from an informal discussion with a monitoring officer to an informal opportunity to speak with affected parties, a written apology, mediation, peer support, requirement to attend relevant training, um, where it's of a serious nature, a bar on chairing advisory or special committees for up to two months, not necessarily something that would apply to parish councils. And again, where of a serious nature, a bar on attending committees for up to two months. But this is simply recommendations. Um, so it will be up to the principal authority to think about sanctions. But again, with the knowledge that sanctions are lacking. Um, I think some of some of the issues are around managing public's expectations. So if I were to make a complaint about a councillor, um, then I would probably, I would want to know what the sanctions are. I would probably want them to be suspended or disbarred because I'm cross with them and I think they've done something unacceptable. Um, but that isn't possible at the moment. So I do think there's a, a real opportunity for um, parish councils, parish clerks to talk to the principal authority um, and to think about what could be put in place to safeguard really the whole standard system.